Good evening, everybody. Uh, I hope uh, you and your families are staying safe and well, you know, during these trying times. Uh, my name is Ronan Wiseman. I'm the Technical Director for Long Island Junior Soccer League. And I want to welcome you all to tonight's webinar with uh, Patrick Iani and Seth Taylor as part of uh, Long Island Junior Soccer League Soccer at Home Initiatives. Welcome, Seth. Uh, welcome, Patrick. Hey, Thanks, thank Rob. you. So tonight we're going to be discussing uh, soccer parenting in uh, 2020 and navigating the anxiety of a return to play. So let me just give you a little background on uh, Patrick and Seth. <clears throat> Excuse me, Patrick is the founder and CEO of Iani Training. Patrick's back. Uh, so he founded Iani Training after a playing career that spanned uh, nine years in the MLS, uh, played in the Olympics in Beijing, was an All-America at UCLA. Uh, all of his experience taught him uh, what is needed in the world of sports uh, in a commitment to training the whole athlete, uh, mind, body, and spirit. Patrick now brings this immense experience coupled with his uh, story of personal transformation to the field every time he works with players from all walks of life. Uh, he lives and works in Newport Beach, California, where I can be found frequently, <coughs> excuse me, on the beach with his wife and two young children. All right, Patrick. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, Seth is the director of content for Yanni Training. Uh, Seth is a writer, life coach, and soccer coach from Seattle, Washington. Uh, he is primarily focused on helping people deal with anxiety, depression, and other experiential struggles as they play out in work, sports, and family life. He's a keynote speaker for Major League Soccer on issues of identity, of life, work, balance, and their athletes, and is the author of On Frame exploring the depths of parenting in the world of youth soccer, as well as the coaching revolution, an interactive guide to finding joy and excellence in coaching. Uh, Seth lives and works in uh, Seattle, Washington, where he enjoys spending time with his wife and two young children. So welcome, Seth. Thank you. Appreciate so, it. Uh, at this point, I'm going to turn it over to you, Seth, and uh, I'll uh, hide my camera and uh, let you take over. All right. Well, I should. You guys tell me, can some of you let me know, do you see my PowerPoint? Yes. All right, we are underway then. We're getting this technology thing down. I only took a, f whoa, I spoke too soon. Oh, there we go. <laughs> just, when, just when I thought we, we had it. Um, thank you guys for letting me be here. Um, I don't know how many guys, maybe you can see me, a little bit of me and then a little bit of my PowerPoint. I can only see my PowerPoint, which is something I'm finally getting used to. Um, I used to do these talks in front of live audiences back in the day when we could all meet together. And uh, now I do these talks sitting on my bed, with my dog sleeping next to me, which it has an upside because I don't have to, I don't have to go anywhere again on any airplanes, but it has a downside because I don't get to see the people that I'm talking to and, and really interact because what we're gonna get into here is, is very deep material. And uh, this is not, um, this is not a simple, Thing that we're doing here and I want to make sure that I, I, I always appreciate being able to look parents in the eye because I'm a dad I got two kids and mine are pretty young you can see this is a picture of my daughter right here actually uh, at a Seattle Sounders game which we frequent uh, we used to frequent back in the day when you were allowed to do that kind of thing and uh, and I put this picture on here particularly um, for my parent talks uh, because it struck me as something when I was thinking about what I wanted to communicate, I saw this picture of her and it was the fact that she kind of, that she's watching a game and she's got a doll in her hands. <laughs> and it always reminds me, you know, she's a Sounders fan because we're Sounders fans. She's not a Sounders fan because she was born and said, I just think I love the Sounders. She goes to these games because she likes to spend time with me. She brought her doll and, and even though she's, this, this kid you're looking at, I had, we adopted her. I wish I could take credit for her athletic ability, but she is a ridiculous, ridiculously crazy high level athletic child. Um, her birth dad played tight end, division one tight end, and their birth mom was a college soccer player. So she's got a very, very, I mean, extremely athletic kid. And um, and she is my reminder of why I do what I do. And, uh, and so I try to guide her, trying to guide her properly. And I'll talk a little bit more about that a bit later, but I wanna get in um, just just right off the, right off the cuff here. Um, you know, Ronan, when Ronan approached us about doing these these talks, he was saying, hey, can we, can we really talk specifically, really aim these things at some of the anxiety we're all experiencing? And so I'm, I'm going to be talking about parenting in the context of soccer, in the context of youth soccer, but understanding it first and foremost, that right now, this talk, I'm giving this talk in a unique context because um, we're not playing soccer. 
and we're all at home with our kids and we're trying to understand what exactly uh, how do we guide them in this world? Because most of us, well, all of us really have never seen anything quite like this, especially you guys out there in New York where you got hit, you know, extraordinarily hard. I mean, we got it pretty good up here in Seattle, but not like you guys. So um, we're going to talk a lot about where does anxiety come from, okay? And we're, so we're going to get into child development, basically child development and, and some quantum physics, a little bit about kind of what we're made of so we can kind of talk about why we parent the way we parent um, and how to maybe wake up a little bit and do it at a little more enlightened level going forward as we try to help our kids navigate not just what they're experiencing now, but, but life, life in general, and especially life as athletes. Um, I work personally um, with a lot of high-level athletes. So I've got, I do, in my personal practice, I work uh, one-on-one with, with, you know, dealing with anxiety issues and how emotional issues disrupt athlete development. And I've got players from young kids playing low levels all the way up to, I've got, you know, having four pro- professional athletes I'm working with right now and, and, and all the gamut in between. And I've worked with parents and I'm doing this kind of thing. And, and what we've, we've really discovered, you know, what Pat and I have kind of invested our lives in understanding and discovering is, is that there is nobody that forms your kids um, as, as athletes more than parents. I mean, for, we, we build this giant industry of player development and coaches and fields and structures and directors and boards and all this kind of thing. And nothing even comes close to the influence that you guys have on your kids uh, when they get in the car after practice, nothing even comes close. I work with these high level professional athletes. I worked with uh, last year, I got the privilege of working with it was just the year before with working with a guy on the U S national team. And he was recovering uh, from an ACL injury and really was experiencing extreme anxiety and had over the first several years of his career and he had good parents they were good people and he was confused why he had so much anxiety but because this context lends itself to a certain type of anxiety formation um and and it's it's almost like it's built into the system he had come away with extreme anxiety he hated soccer and i had the opportunity to work with him and and uh and really help him reform his identity and it was fascinating because he's going from a player who hated soccer and was really struggling to a guy who's playing the best soccer of his life and he's loving it because we were able to do some of the really really good work of getting into his identity and help helping form him in a new way and uh and his dad you know a shout out his dad his dad's a good man he's a good parent but he was also part of the system and the system itself is it's not it's nobody's fault we just we created something here that lends itself to form to disrupting the identity, a healthy identity formation for our kids. So I'm going to try to help you guys navigate this through this talk. So let's just about jump in. Uh, that's my little daughter Kenya, and I cherish this picture every time I do this talk. So I just got to take it in for a second and remind myself why I do this. Um, goals for this talk are obvious. Um, I'm not going to read this to you. You guys can read it, but but this is very much about understanding why we do what we do. Okay, you guys are all. Um, I've got a slide towards the end that shows an iceberg but I'll just kind of preview it now. We are essentially human beings are icebergs. Most of what we do comes from the unconscious. So our goal is to make, uh, to bring about a deep awareness of why we do what we do. You know, where is all this stuff coming from? Why do we cheer? Why do we not cheer? Why do we say that thing to our kid in the car that maybe we know we shouldn't say? Maybe, maybe we say stuff and we don't even know we shouldn't say it. Why are we blind to that? You know, why are there, why, why do our kids start to to push back on us so hard so quick why does it seem like they you know why don't they want to be coached by us you know these kind of things so we're trying to trying to understand these things so that we can create a uh, a deeper a deeper uh, awareness on the sideline and that you guys can share that with other parents and we can all kind of become a more awakened culture on the sideline so one we can enjoy it more and we can relax a little bit and two the referees can enjoy it more <laughs> three the coaches can enjoy it more and most of all so our kids can enjoy it more and really continue to play instead of beginning to work when they're on the field. So we'll get into why that happens. So we're going to start with real basic. We're going to start with a, uh, you know, you guys know, probably know what this is, a bell-shaped curve. Um, parent drama is the driving problem in youth sports. Now, the anxiety, even the kid, the anxiety that our kids are experiencing right now during COVID-19 is for the most part them processing an experience they got from us. From the second your kids are born, Okay. From the second your kids are born, they are looking to your face to understand why, why the world is the way it is and how they should absorb it. 
they they're looking for the narratives that you speak to them the narratives that you play that play out in your relationship with your significant others and in the world around them to understand that why they're okay if if you're okay they're okay and that's how kids work right now uh most of us fall on this spectrum somewhere every team i've coached for 15 years in club ball about 20 years total and every team i ever coached had this spectrum i had a couple mother Teresas, you know some really enlightened parents you know and you know usually there's one or two of those and then i've i've got some pretty nasty disney moms you know and it's not just moms i just did moms in this one specifically i mean you get the dads of course and you get the disney moms over there that are just you know subtly and they don't even they're not even aware of it but they're just doing real real obvious damage and everybody's watching them and then you got you know the Lori Laughlin's in the middle which were the only difference between her and us is she's got a lot of money and 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 fame and we didn't have that but but most of us are there in the middle you know when I talk to directors they're like how do we change this thing I say well let's let's leave the two the ends of the spectrum alone let's let's try to work with the the Lori Laughlin's in the middle and um, you know, but unfortunately, the Disney moms, the, the ones at the, at the extreme end of the, the spectrum tend to give us all permission to be kind of mildly crazy. And you guys know, if you're parents, you understand that parenting is fundamentally, a, it's a spectrum of insanity, right? Because you wake up every day, your kids are going to, they're going to tap into that. You know, they're going to, I mean, I had before breakfast, I had five things this morning that my kids did that, you know, could push those buttons quite easily, you know? And in the context of, you know, of what we're going on, what's going on right now, I live in a small apartment in the city. I got two kids. My daughter's seven and a half years old and she's ready to bounce off the wall. So every day, you know, things are getting broken and things. So, you know, most of us kind of live on that, you know, that spectrum of insanity, but, but most of us aren't those at the twos at the end. Right. So what I want to try to understand is help you guys understand is how this forms kids. Okay. So to understand this, you understand just basic, we're going to go some child development 101, very, very basic zero to 10, okay? Ages zero to 10 is what we call the developmental years, all right? And some of you guys might remember your, your psych classes in school or whatever, but the primary developmental years are like zero to five, secondary is like five to 10, but those are that develop, it's a different phases that children go through. And if you do like my wife did, where you get a master's degree in this stuff, you, you just study every single phase so you understand what every child is supposed to be experiencing you know, age from, from zero to about nine months, you know, they're in a certain phase and then they go into what's called the mirror phase and they start to shift and they start to change and then they develop separation anxiety and they, they keep going. Well, those phases continue all through those developmental years. And, and the crazy thing is, is that inside those developmental years, we start throwing some stuff at them that they're not on a cultural level. It's a normal thing for us in our culture to throw things at kids that they're actually not developmentally ready for. And and you know, if we understand that their two pri their primary purpose in the development years is to develop their identity, okay, which is a sense of who you are. It's not who, what I do; it's who you are. Their their primary task is to develop a deep identity or some what someone would call a healthy attachment, meaning they know who they are, and they find that by asking these two questions. So unconsciously, you have to recognize that a child between zero and ten is asking these two questions. What makes me safe? What makes me valuable? Now, in the context of COVID-19, if you have a child that's under the, if that's in those phases, you have to know, no matter what they're saying, this is the questions they're asking. Am I safe? Am I valuable? Am I safe? Am I valuable? And if you're walking around listening to the news 24 seven and you're anxiety ridden all the time and you're walking unconsciously into a grocery store and there's paranoia or something like that, they're going to absorb that. And they're going to answer these two questions through their experience of you, okay? Just so you guys know, this is what's always going for kids those age, that age. Now, ideally, in those developmental years, okay, home life, let's just say that's mom and dad, okay, that's the primary caretaker. Home life is where we find that sense of who we are. And I and ideally, and again, nobody does this perfectly. Nobody. There are no perfect parents. We all know this. I I'm, I do this for a living, and I am far <laughs> from perfect. Nobody gets out of childhood without some sort of trauma. And, and it's because ideally what we're talking about is unconditional love, meaning our kids know who they are and they know that they are love based on when, when they, they start acting in the world, they're looking to your face to go, am I safe? Am I valuable? And our, ideally our reflection back to them is, yes, you're safe, you're valuable, right? But then they start to explore the world. Okay, we can call this performance world. They, you know, they're starting from the very beginning of, hey, dad, you know, they're pretty soon they're 
trying to stand on their feet and they're looking at you. And after a while they go into that, you know, five, six, seven, where it's dad, what daddy watch, daddy watch, you know, daddy being, you know, me, daddy watch, daddy watch, daddy watch, daddy watch. And they want me to watch, 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 watch. And they're looking for that reflection. And of course, these are the years where we start going, oh, they want me to be their cheerleader. When what they actually want is, am I safe? Am I valuable? Am I safe? Am I valuable? And they want to know that they're safe and they're valuable because it's my daughter. That's why she's safe and valuable. But they start to pick up very early on that if I do things, I get a better response. And this is this is almost built into childhood. It's difficult to do this really, really well. When you're trained, trained in child child uh, uh, play therapy, which is a child development form, you know, formation therapy, where like what my, my wife was trained in, they train you to try to stay neutral. The idea is a child does something and you stay neutral in your face and you say, you did that all by yourself. And that you try to connect their performance to their sense of self as much as humanly possible. Well, of course, we don't do that. And it's hilarious. My wife was trained to that. She still doesn't do that with her own kids. She does it with her clients, but not with her own kids. So like we were at a swimming pool a few months ago when you were allowed to do that kind of thing. And we we were at the Y and uh, and my son went down this, he's six, and he went down this uh, this big curly kind of water slide and he plunged in the water. And my wife just goes, yeah. And she just goes crazy. And I said, hey, what are you doing? And she's like, what was that? She said, well, I just want him to know we're proud of him. So we're going down a water slide, you know, because from this perspective, isn't it obvious what he just did? I, I said to her, does he get that anywhere else in his life? Does he get that response? I said, well, no. She's like, well, what am I supposed to do? I'm like, the same thing you did when you were trained to do. Just stay as neutral as you can. Connect it as much as you can to his own experience. So we're not, because really quickly, remember, if he's asking these two questions and, and he's looking to us to give it to him. Well, all of a sudden, this performance over here got him a totally different. All that is is rocket-fueled, adrenaline-fueled love. He sees that face. He sees that response. And so, you know, when parents say, "Well, I, I tend to be the positive parent on the sideline. I cheer a lot." I'm like, "Well, yeah, that's good." But what we have to understand is, even that, okay, when they're in the developmental years, they're five years old, they're six years old, and they score that goal and they get that cheer to the child. Okay, remember, these are the questions they're asking. What makes me safe? What makes me valuable? Not what makes me a great player. Not how do I play in a World Cup someday? They're not asking those questions. Their life is an unconscious one. They're saying, what makes me safe and valuable? And when they kick the ball in that goal and they get that response, very quickly, this little developing ego starts to create this, like, when I do this, I get that. And that, I got to get that. Because that is just this rocket fuel love. So what happens is our world starts to look like this. Okay, now think about the age we put our kids in the field because the system says, well, we got to get them technically training by the time they're five, six, seven. You know, we, we got them on the field. When I speak at the MLS Rookie Symposium, I always ask the guys, how, how young were you when you started? And they, get, they tend to get down around three, two and three. That's when they first started playing, organized by four, right? The psychology research is quite clear. It has been for a long time. Kids actually shouldn't play organized sports till they're about 12. Now, I'm not here to tear that system down because I understand that our system, and we've got a billion dollar, multi-billion dollar system here going on, but we do need to be, become aware that the structure itself is adverse to the identity development of a child. So when you put a, you put a five-year-old or a six-year-old into that arena, and that's what it is, it's an arena, and then you put those lines around them and you give them that structure and you say, here's the rules, here's the structure, here's the goal, here's the ball, here's your teammates, here's your coach, and here's all this structure, it's actually quite adverse. It's not the free flow, psycho-spiritual state that we call play. You put a child in the sandbox and you just back up, right? You don't go, here's the sand, here's the thing, here's the shovel, give five shovels, put them in that thing. You don't do any of that. You just go play. And of course, they find their own way. They start to just, they just it's a dance. It's this weird abstract ballet that children do. My children, I came out this morning. It was great. I, got, I was listening around the corner and they're playing Legos. And I turn around the corner and they're just creating their world because big giant basket of Legos and they're just going crazy. And nothing gives me more pleasure because that's pure child identity, just an abstract exploration of the world through play, right? So that's what they were doing. And I could have easily come in and said, no, no kids, no kids. Here's how we do this right. Here's the instructions, build the X-wing, build the, you know, whatever it was. And I would be disrupting, you know, that actual identity formation, that natural identity formation they have. They were, they were out in performance world. Let's just play, right? And then. Of course, they're going to come to me later and go, Daddy, can we show you what we built? And they're coming to home to see, am I safe? Am I valuable? Right? 
and we want some distance between these two. But of course, in our in organized sports world, and in most of our worlds, I mean, think about it, school is performance. By the time they're five, six years, years old, my son started kindergarten this year. We start, he started a little, you know, he's a little older in the kindergarten, but he started kindergarten. And at one point I hear him crying in his bed. I come home and go, what's going on, bud? And he was stressed out because of a reading assignment. I was like, what? He's like, what? I go, what, what are you talking, what, what's going on here? I take him in my arms and he's crying and he's a real sensitive kid. And I'm, I'm, I'm just rocking him and I say, hey, no matter what, no matter what, no matter what, we love you, no matter what. Because I know that the questions he's asking are these, what makes me safe, what makes me valuable. So I spent some time reassuring him, you're safe and you're valuable because you're my son. And then I looked at him and I very clear, quickly pulled these two worlds apart. I went here and said, hey, no matter what happens over there, you're safe, you're valuable, you're good. You don't even have to worry about that stuff. Don't even worry about that stuff. And I just started to pull that apart. You're safe, you're valuable, we love you, no matter what. Now, you know, it's, it's a little easier with school sometimes, you know, but with sports, it's tough because we're right there. We're in that, we're on that sideline. They don't let us sit out on the field with them, right? You know, my son wants to play soccer because he sees that it's a huge part of my world. He sees me watching pro soccer on the weekends. We go to Sounders games. You know, he, I, I know a bunch of the players, you know. He knows, you know, he can hang out with Jordan and give him high fives and Christian Roldan and these guys. And he, and he loves it. And so he's already, I can tell he's picking up on the fact that, one, it's fun because we just dork around in the living room. I got a ball sitting in the living room at all times. And he knows that dad might give me, dad will really like me better. He'll, he'll love me a little more if I do this. So I can see him kind of pushing. And we do this little soccer camp every summer. We go to Red Wine Soccer Camp and it's just, a, we just play. And they, they just do camp games there. It's just pure play. They don't try to box anybody in. They don't try to develop players. They just, let's just play stuck in the mud and freeze tag and this kind of stuff. And so they just play and I'll, and I'll go and, and he wants to just play, play, play. And afterwards he wants to work on his skills. And he wants to do these kind of things. And I'm holding him back from that super organized structure so that he can continue to play. But sometimes he'll say, dad, can we go play soccer? I'll say, yeah. We'll go down to Starfire with the Sounders train down here and they got a bunch of fields open and we'll, we'll go down there and we'll go out there and he'll go, we teach me how to play. I'll go, yeah. And then we'll get to the field and I'll go, so you want me to teach you how to play? And he'll go, no. <laughs> and I'll go, okay, what do you want to do? And then he'll just make it up as we go. I go, he'll go, I'm going to play soccer. I go, okay, what's the rules? And he'll just come up with the rules. And there's just, it's like a sandbox. He's just free flowing. Yeah, you can just do whatever you want. You know, he just starts coming up with this crazy you know, he'll, hey, I'll be ending up in a penalty box while he goes and back and forth, scores on both goals for, and I'll be like, can I come out now? No, you can't. You got a red card. And he'll just come up with these ideas. So the idea, the idea is that we continue as long as possible to allow them that free flow, which is honestly, you guys, if you think about it, this is one of the reasons the world is better than we are at the game. Because most of those kids, when I was, Afri when I lived in Africa when I was a little kid, and we just played on a stand lot and there were no parents anywhere, ever. <laughs> All the kids just came to the sand lot. And we just, somebody threw a ball out, we started playing, we played for hours and hours and hours. And, and so our love, again, was separate, safe at home. And we'd go home and mom would be like, you hungry? Yeah. What were you doing? Playing soccer? Did you have a good time? Yeah. All right. And that was it. So I got to develop my relationship with soccer in a very different way. Okay. So that's the idea. And I hope I'm hammering that home pretty good. This is how they're developing this, okay? And it becomes confusing when, when, you know, when I do this, I get that. And I form this triangulated relationship now with the game of soccer, okay? So if home world and performance world are on top of each other like this, if I kick the ball well, I get that. Now, what's important is you understand that very quickly, by about age eight or so, the shadow starts to show up to that. For most kids, the shadow shows up, which means what if I don't do this well? I, I do it well, I get this, especially because the, by then the conversations are revolving how was practice, how was practice, and the kids start learning how to report every day. Practice was good, practice was not good. Parents start trying to fix things. Parents are on the sideline, they're trying to help them navigate, and it becomes such a part of the world that that triangulated relationship continues to get stronger and stronger, and pretty soon soccer is playing a parental role, okay? So soccer, now parents me. Soccer is required to love me. And there is a problem with that because soccer can't love you. So the anxiety starts to develop, okay? Now, you guys probably recognize this. This is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. For those of you guys that have uh, um, taken a little psych 101 at some point, you probably saw this. And what 
what I want you guys to understand is that, you know, as we, when we're born, you know, the first things that this is the way this works is you got to get your base needs met first, right? So essentially a human being, if they can't get the base needs, physiological needs, you know, air, water, food, shelter, sex, if those things can't be met, then you don't, you can't give any energy to the next one, okay, which is safety, safety and security, right? And if you don't have safety and security met, then you stop there. You just stop there. Safety and security and physio and right and, and young children find their safety and security where? Within the wings of their parents, within the love of their parents. Even though love and belonging, that's the next level. That's where you start to develop loving and belonging relationships. For most kids, by five, six, seven years old, they're already starting to have this kind of survival level mentality towards towards things like, you know, soccer. Like especially, I mean, you, it really shows up 11, 12, 13. When they exit those developmental years and they go into adolescence, you'll see that survivor show up because of there's a there's trauma present and there's younger parts of them trying to get their need for love and safety met by playing the game but the game isn't safe you're going to fail it's inevitable right so we tend to get stuck you probably know i'm sure everybody here if you're not one of these people you probably know someone who's kind of stuck at the safety level you know that guy with 10 million's got to get 15 you know why is that person like and, you know pat and i used to talk about this when he was playing in mls he made lots of money but he was like why does it feel like there's never enough because there was a survivor always present, right? So as opposed to being able to thrive, you, do, you just keep surviving, you keep surviving. You'll notice that a lot of kids, they get to 12, 13, 14, and their game is very survival-based. There's not, there's a lack of creativity. There's a lack of risk. You know, they, they're afraid to take a risk. They're afraid to train their weaknesses. They're just surviving, right? Because if I stay here, I stay safe. I can get the thing I need to get. Don't take the risk. You will fail. And if you fail, you lose the love. Because remember, so we've now developed a relationship with the game that is love, okay? I get my love from soccer. And when I fail, I lose that love. And of course, that's triangulated by it from that main source of the development, the identity development, which is parents, okay? So, they, so a lot of people are stuck. And what I, I put ego and higher self, spirit, true self, whatever term you, you prefer, to just let you guys know that, that the ego, okay, which is essentially the thinking brain, okay? Frontal lobe, reptilian brain kind of stuff. This is the survivor part of us tends to run the show when you're stuck in a place of safety and security, okay? So for most people, they live through their brain. How many of you guys think too much? How many of you guys struggle sleeping well? How many of you guys um, you know, live where there's a common sense of drama and things like that around you? Well, well, most kids are stuck in that space, so they live from their egos, as opposed to being able to kind of move into that higher level of self-awareness that's kind of starts to move down into the body where, you know, we can call it, I call it spirit, it's, it's you know, we can get into the physics of it a bit later, but the idea is that there is a higher part of us with a higher consciousness where there, where peace and love and joy and things like that are found, right? But most kids don't get there because the trauma from this experience keeps them locked into a safety and security. I had a 13 year old kid the other day, I was working with a really talented player and I was working with him. When I started working with him and I said, so you wanna be a pro, is that the goal? And he goes, no, this is a 13 year old kid. No, I just think I, uh, I think I think I'm gonna you know maybe try to look for something with a little more of like a, a you know a sure paycheck. I went wait wait what <laughs> like what did you say? He's 13 and he's already thinking about getting a steady paycheck, right? If there's if that doesn't scream trauma, he's stuck at safety and security. He can't even have a dream about becoming a professional athlete. And even the ones that I know that really dream for it, they're not dream they're dreaming for it because they know it'll get them more love, right? And, our, and, and that's, that's pretty sad. It says something about the way we're developing these kids. It says a lot about why we get stuck, why we're not performing, especially on the men's side. The women's side is that there's an overall anxiety that exists on the planet that's very, very different. It's a, to, it's a very almost, it's not different psychology, but it's a different measuring tool because the women are winning World Cups, but our girls are having the same experience our boys are having, if not more, um, when it comes to this safety and security and the survivor mentality. But the, you know, it really shows up on the men's side because it's been being played for so long. You see it. We're competing at these youth levels internationally, but you get to the men's level, we're not even close because those guys are surviving. The guy that I worked with was one of the top players on the national team. And he was hating soccer. And I know a lot of those guys have that exact same experience. So we, we're developing because of the way we, because of this, we're developing players that are stuck down there in their egos. And it makes it so that you can't, the ego doesn't enjoy things. You're not going to have fun playing soccer. Soccer is like running a minefield. Most of these kids are stepping out there. We're going, hand them a ball and go, well, you know, try not to get killed. And they're running out there with so many opportunities to lose and fail. 
that they're going to lose that love. And, it's, and by 12, 13, 14, it starts to show up as a true anxiety, right? They love, you ask most kids why they play soccer. They love their friends, right? And, and beyond that, they're not usually sure, you know? Very few of them love the game. And even, and even the ones that say they love the game don't necessarily do it. They just know they're supposed to, they're supposed to love the game, right? Every once in a while, you'll find someone who truly does. It's a bit rare, though. So all of this, you guys, it, it actually develops this, the condition of being stuck at that safety and, and physical object is, is what we, we commonly know as PTSD, okay? So uh, we're going to get into what PTSD is, what post-traumatic stress is, and how it functions at a couple different levels. And let me look at the time real quick here. 2.30. Okay, so I'm, gonna, I'm not going to bust through this too fast because you'll miss it. But, but what we essentially are experiencing, the reason our kids, the reason kids are quitting and burning out the level they are, the reason that the parent drama exists on the sideline, the reason that the system is burdened with so much of this kind of emotional burden is because everyone, every human being, every person has a certain level of PTSD. Okay, now if you're a psychologist, there's, you know, right now I think there's, I want to say, a six different classifications for PTSD. One of them, you know, we'll probably all know the example of acute PTSD. Okay, acute PTSD, we're getting into the physics over here. Okay, acute PTSD is, uh, let's say, a soldier, you know, coming home from war. And I'm going to use acute PTSD as an example to teach you guys about what this is, and then we'll draw it into the space where most of us live, which is what we call un uncomplicated PTSD. Okay. And, or, you know, some people say generalized, but that's just kind of a, that's not an official term. Uncomplicated PTSD is what I had, okay? It's what most of you guys have. Um, I, I might have had a little more severe than that, but, but what it is is this, okay? So uh, imagine that soldier, okay? A soldier goes to Afghanistan. I hope there's no, I don't want to do any stereotypes here, but, but I know a few guys like this. Actually, actually, you know, I'll use my friend from Rwanda. I got a buddy from Rwanda, okay? And he was part of the military that came in and stopped the genocide in 1994. Okay, for those of you guys that don't know, worst genocide in human history was in Rwanda, 1994. He comes in to stop it, experiences some brutality, of course, as you can imagine. And I, I discovered this about 10, it was about 12 years ago. And this is before I knew all this stuff. You go to his house for dinner, and he married an American girl. He was living in Portland, Oregon, in this beautiful little home over at the, they had this big, huge window that had all these uh, pine trees out there. It's just gorgeous. And we go to sit down for dinner and his wife sits down and my wife sits down and I sit down and the last chair that was left was sitting there empty and he was standing there. And I looked at him and I said, you, you okay? He wouldn't sit down. And his wife says, um, he can't sit with his back to the window. I'm like, Why not? And he said, I'm afraid someone will shoot me. So he had a, a trauma response because his, there was a, one chair in Portland, Oregon with his back to the window. Okay, now, to understand this, okay, a lot of people are like, well, you know, he has a psychological issue called PTSD, and we just kind of gloss over it. But what we want to try to understand is I'm going to help you understand the physics of this, okay, because there's something really, really fascinating at the core of what that actually is. Okay, now, to do this, I'm going to give you a very quick crash course in some of the very, very basics of quantum physics. Okay, my friend, his name was Amon. Amon is 99% empty space. If you shrink up all the space between the atoms, he's mostly not there. It's an illusion of solid matter, okay? If I was to punch him, I'd hit solid matter, but that's an illusion that exists on a material plane, okay, which is where we live right now. Some people call this a three-dimensional world, okay? Now, many of you guys seen the Marvel movies. They like to play around with quantum physics. You know, in Ant-Man, they say, in the quantum realm, you know, things, you know, time and space work very differently down there. Well, understand, we all exist in the quantum realm, okay? It just depends on what level you perceive them at. If I was to break them on down, and just start breaking them into pieces and smaller and smaller and smaller. We get down to cells, and then we get down to molecules, and then we get down to atoms, and then we get down to protons, neutrons, electrons, right? And then most of us don't know anything beyond that, right? But there's, you know, bosons and quarks. And they, actually, there's about 150 different subatomic particles that have been identified so far. But what we know is that when you get down to atoms and you get smaller than that, there's a, there is a place down there called the Planck scale, okay? And that's just a line that's named after a physicist named Max Planck. It's basically a, a line where once you cross into that realm, you are now into the quantum realm. And now we don't exist, okay? My friend Amon no longer obeys the laws of space and time as we understand it, okay? So on a material level, he's, you know, a 40 year old plus man, right? That is, you know, living on linear, what we call linear space and time. He's located in Portland, Oregon. He has a past, he has a future, 
hopefully, right? He's, he's moving forward in time and getting older. On a quantum realm, time isn't linear, it's spherical. Okay, it actually works in a parallel sense. This is where uh, multiverse theory came from, for you Doctor Strange fans. Right? Multiverse theory came from this idea that actually time runs in a parallel sense, every moment parallel to the other. Okay, So time and space become somewhat of an illusion. And there's this thing we call the time-space continuum that when you go above the Planck scale, now we exist in linear time and space. Now what has to under be understood okay, about trauma is this. Amon has an energetic body. He has a physical body, and he has an, an emotional body, and he has an energetic body. Some people with wisdom traditions, they call that the soul. Uh, scientists would probably say core consciousness, right? But the idea is that he has an energetic body that can actually be wounded. It can be fractured. If you've ever seen someone go into shock, okay, or dissociate, right? If someone experiences violence, okay, they, you'll see them go into shock. And what that is is an actual fracturing, or just I'm going to say fracturing of the soul. Okay, and, and what happens is in that moment, a piece of him broke off. Okay, in, the, in, in one of those experiences or probably multiple of those experiences, a piece of him literally snapped off to ex escape the experience. Okay, and now that part of him essentially fell off the train in a sense, fell out of the space time continuum and is stuck outside of it now and is stuck in that space in that time. And that, and it's now in a time loop and it's experiencing trauma all the time. So a part of him was literally stuck in Rwanda, being traumatized all the time, which is why his mind could literally create, his ego mind creates a story in his brain that if I sit down with my back to the window, someone's going to shoot me, which of course has no place in logic. You know, he was a pretty relatively functional human being, right? Uh, on the outside, you get deep with him, it starts to break down a little bit because it's tough when you carry that kind of trauma. But you know, if you think about it, you, go, you can look at that guy and go, dude, you're, you're safe. You're safe. And you can try to convince him all you want, but a part of him clearly is not. So you'll see some soldier come home from war and you'll be like, man, it's like a part of him got left on the battlefield. Well, that's actually true. You know, and now he has to drink more alcohol and he's got 12 guns in his closet to make himself feel safe. I'm, <laughs> I used to sell countertops. This is a crazy story. I used to sell countertops and I went to uh, um, this guy's house and, and there's a big, you know, beware dog, you know, some picture of this dog like eating a guy on the on the door, which, you know, as a sales guy, I, it was always a little scary, but I went in and within a few minutes of being in this guy's house, I had a gun in my hand and he was teaching me close quarters combat techniques about how I should shoot the hostage. This guy's got your wife by a neck. What do you do? Shoot the hostage. It's crazy. He had guns all over the counters. He was a bodyguard and he was former Delta Force and he clearly had tremendous amounts of trauma, but he wouldn't let his wife go jogging without packing heat, right? Because some part of his ego said, this means we'll be safe. When clearly he, he was safe, he lived in a very safe neighborhood in a very safe part of the world. But what that is, is it, it's an actual wound, okay? So now, taking all what you just said, understand, to, let's take it into a more uncomplicated PTSD, as opposed to, I can't sit down by a window. Our kids express things like, and we express things like insecurity, okay? Uh, things like jealousy, um, frustration, anger. Uh, when we put pressure on our kids, when we need our kids to be something else, when we, when we, uh, uh, we get super frustrated, super annoyed, the, the kind of the emotional reactions we have, road rage, frustration with, with whatever situation, like we are expressing PTSD. Anything, actually, some people would say anything that doesn't, that is outside the realm of accepting what is, is an expression of PTSD. So if there's a part of me Okay, so I have a five or six year old part of me stuck in stuck somewhere trying to earn love on a soccer field somewhere and when I was a child, right? And it's still trying to get its needs for love and safety, right? Love and safety, affirmation, love and safety. It's trying to get that need met in my life. Where is that gonna show up? Who's gonna have to carry that burden for me? My wife, my kids, even my dog. Okay, this is where the whole mystery of the cat lady comes from. Right? If I have five animals, they'll love me unconditionally. Right? And it fills that void as long as I don't have to actually do human relationship because that's too tough, it's too painful. Right? right? The entire idea is that, I mean, this is where parent drama comes from. We're on the sideline and we are projecting our unconscious needs onto our children. And we need them to do well. We don't just want them to do well, we need them. A part of us unconsciously needs them to do well. That's why it turns into such a crazy thing. Right? Because you ask your kids, hey, do you like it when I do that? They'll say, no, of course not. Right? Most of them want us to stop. 
we get in the car and they're giving us the report. What they prefer is that we actually meet them emotionally, right? How are you feeling? And that they can come into a place where no matter what, they can just be met with love and safety, right? So the idea, idea now is what, what we want to do is come to, come to recognize how much of those needs are being met, you know, by our kids, how we're projecting onto our kids. And, you know, this is where the, the iceberg thing comes into it, where most of us are these very, very unconscious things. I was telling coaches or your coaches, your parent players, your parents, everyone you know, yes, I am serious, we are icebergs. 70 to 75% of what we are doing every day is coming from our unconscious, mostly our unconscious unmet needs. That is uncomplicated PTSD. It's being projected on to our parents. We project it. I mean, think about it. Why do we, why is there a referee shortage? Why do we blast referees the way we do? Because they are disrupting our ability to get our needs met. You know, someone kicks your kids, someone does this thing and this, which is all very normal parts of the game of soccer. And we have this reaction from our guts because there is something expressing itself from our own unmet needs. And this causes a massive, massive disruption in our kids' ability to get their needs met. They're already out there, you know, earning love. And now they have to do some sort of, they have, essentially what happens is our kids end up parenting us. And they got to meet our needs with what they're doing. And it disrupts, it kills their love for the game. Okay, Because again, they have this triangulated sense of the game already. I have to do this to get the love. And if I don't do this, I don't get the love. And they start to feel the burden of carrying our weight for us. Okay? Now, I deal with lots of kids. This last year, I've worked with a whole bunch of kids that are really good players, really good kids. You know, their, their parents, one, one girl on the team, I worked with her and she started playing really well. So of course, all the moms are, hey, what'd you do? The way we work with this guy. So they came to us. You know, I was working with this kid and we were, we keep doing this work of finding these young parts of her that are kind of stuck on these soccer fields, just earning love, earning love, always earning love. All I have to do is push her in a drill, push her beyond her skill set, let her make it so she fails and immediately her body starts to shut down. And we, we work with these parts of her. And I remember one day I said to her, I said, you know, her dad's a really good guy and I like him. He's a good man. And I said, do you think your dad loves you? She said, yeah. I said, does it feel like love? And immediately she had tears coming in her eyes. She said, no, it doesn't. I said, right. So is it? And she's like, I don't know. That's a complicated question, isn't it? It's a very complicated question. If it's not being experienced as love, is it love? Now, I'm a dad. No one's going to tell me I don't love my kids. I do. Okay? Very, very much. But I've come to understand that a lot of what they experience from me isn't love. And I mask it in their, their I have an emotional experience of my children. I love them very much. But I've come to recognize that a lot of what I do isn't exactly love. It's trying to meet my needs. I need my kids to be different than they are, say something different than they are, act different than what they want to act. And it's not that there's not a place to discipline my kids. I don't want my daughter tearing our apartment down. But I've come to recognize that a lot of what I'm expressing actually is on my own unmet needs, my need for love and safety, uh, my need for security. And I project that onto my kids, right? And if my daughter's out on the soccer field and she's having it pretty soon, she starts, she switches from playing soccer to working because there is something here to be earned. And what I, my whole goal is that my kids would continue to play. I asked the guys at the MLS Rookie Symposium one year, I said, when, think back in your life, when did the game become work? And it's quite remarkable. Uh, most of them, you know, were saying about well, five, six, seven years old. I mean, one, I remember two guys from the LA Galaxy said six and seven. That was when, at six years old, they stopped playing soccer and they started working for love. And that's why they would line up afterwards to tell me how much they hated soccer. And they'd tell me about, you know, suicide ideation and, and self-harm. And I, I, some of the most remarkable things I've ever heard coming from professional athletes, you know, because the ones that are better at it, they're the ones that get it even more. Because that, that gets much, much stronger for them. They're getting it from lots of different angles. Right? Now, all this to say, okay, the solution here is that we have to wake up. As a parent culture, we have to wake up. You know, someone asked me, how would you fix it? I'd say, well, I'd send every parent to therapy for a year. That's what's required to do a very focused therapy on here's your kids going into soccer. Here's what we're going to do. And we're going to start to identify all those parts of us that are actually projecting those needs on our kids so that we can wake up and become an enlightened parent culture the Mother Teresa's on the sideline that will allow our kids to be whatever they want to be, right? That all things are acceptable. 
that we don't need them to be anything other than what they are, especially we protect those developmental years. When they get 12, 13, 14, if, they're, if that, that development has been done well, then they can get pushed because a good, healthy 13-year-old kid needs a challenge, needs to get pushed, needs to get work. They can go from there. But the problem is, is that we're building the foundation at such a young age. And then they're coming into those adolescent years and there's enough damage done that they're already trying to take care of all those young parts of them still trying to get their needs met. And the game is just rot with, you know, it's like a minefield. It's just rot with anxiety, right? So, you know, and I've been pushing guys, I'm pushing people, I'm pushing directors in your league. I'm pushing, you know, the everybody I possibly can. Pat and I are preaching from the mountaintop going, we have got to do something as a culture. We've created a bit of a monster here. We've got to change it. And so we are continuing to just push clubs and leagues to adopt tools that are effective tools for transformation, okay? We're not talking about parent education. People say, well, we need to do some parent education. I say, you can't educate parents. I'm a parent. I don't want anybody telling me what to do with my kid, right? I don't want, I'm the one that was up. My son didn't sleep through the night for two and a half years. I woke up five times a night <laughs> for two and a half years. When he was sick, I was the one there. I want, I don't, don't tell me what to do with my child, but I, but we do need to create parent transformational tools. We need to create something that honors the depth of parenting. And that's what I will hope that during this talk, and you know, when we're going to go into a Q and A here in a second, but what, what I want to do is I want to honor that what we're doing is the deepest thing that people do. Parenting is the deepest thing, right? And we have to demand that player development in our clubs begins with child development. First and foremost, this is a child development business, not a player development business. We got to get the cart behind the horse so that we can actually develop kids that have a passion and a love for the game that goes out beyond their adolescent years so that they continue to want to play and want to grow. And we, if we start passing down a legacy of really healthy identities, right? I mean, I, I work with these pro athletes that come out of their careers. They don't know who they are. They have no clue who they are because they've been training since they were five years old to earn their parents' love. And they're trying to do it at the highest level now, and hopefully some of them make some money. But even then, they come out of it as these kind of survivors. Pat can attest to that. He played at the MLS for nine years. He played in the Olympics. He's one of those guys that's going, why didn't he make it to a World Cup? Well, it was because the game was too, was, was too dangerous, right? So what we have to do is we've got to wake up. Now, not to do too much of a sales pitch here, but Pat and I have created a resource to do that, okay? Um, this is a, a therapeutic guidebook. It's not just a book that you read. It is a therapeutic guidebook experience it's super fun it's super compelling and it's super interesting and it's very digestible it's not going to scare anybody but what it is is this is a process that will help you ground everything i just said in the deepest way possible so that you can be that buddha on the sideline that mother Teresa on the sideline and you can have a it'll if your kids are older it'll help you know how to repair the damage that's been done if your kids are younger it'll help you navigate so you don't do that damage and it will give your kid every opportunity to actually improve. It's on Amazon. Um, some of the clubs, I know Garden City is taking taking it into their club and starting to distribute it on a, on a uh, wider basis. Our goal is that every single parent in America, of course, reads this. And that's the goal of uh, the USU soccer president as well. And, and we are working towards, you know, bringing this in as a as a resource for everybody there is. If you type in my name, Seth Taylor on Amazon, you'll see it right there. Or you can go to ianitraining.com. Um, obviously, you can see we've got endorsements, you know, Pam Morgan's, you know, Alex Morgan's mom, Thought it was amazing. Jordan Morris's dad said, he told us that he said it took me 20 years to learn um, what, what you can learn in on frame. So we, we got one for coaches as well. And we're trying to get the coaches on that board because again, coaching is deep. This is all so, so, so deep what we're doing. Um, but yeah, we're trying to, we're trying to change the, change the world and change the culture. And first and foremost, by honoring the depth of parenting is it, this isn't something we can just slap a bunch of rules on you guys, tell you what to say, what not to say. Here's your five things you should say. Here's your five things you shouldn't. We can give you advice if that's what you want, but what we need to do first and foremost is say, hey, this, this is the deepest thing and let's go there. So that is my presentation and we're going to move into a and a now. Um, thank you guys for allowing me to be here and I know Pat's going to jump in on the Q&A as well, but we are open to any and all questions you might have about this uh, incredibly deep topic. Um, I hope I was understanding. I know I get a little bit, just a touch, too casual and I'm talking straight out my computer here sitting on my bed with a ball cap on and my dog next to me. I apologize. I usually keep it a little more formal, but, uh, but you know, that's, that's life nowadays. So um, I'll hand it over to, to Ronan and we can, we can do some Q and A. Thanks Seth. Some really good stuff there. Seth, I think your camera may be off. 
Oh, did it? Uh, yeah. Oh, I that. Hit a button. Well, there you go. Back on. I'm sorry. Uh, so, uh, Patrick, I'm just going to ask you if you could give us uh, a little background on yourself and your experiences, you know, growing up, and and also, uh, you know, how you related to your parents and so on and so forth. That that you know, maybe we may find that uh, you know some of the same experiences that uh, some of our uh, parents uh, are having or, or have had. Sure. Uh, so I. I've done some quite a bit of reflection and therapy um, since since retiring from Major League Soccer in 2015, and um, in that time, I've started to realize some real truths about that relationship that uh, that I believe my ego has protected me or protected me from for a very long time, and some of those things are uh, just this basic idea that I I I was carrying and a lot of anxiety. And a lot of depression that was affecting the way that I would interact with the game. And some real hard examples for that are um, when I was playing in Seattle, I would um, every day before practice, we would play. We would just play kind of pickup soccer. And I was free and I was having fun and trying things and was really good. Uh, and then the coaches would come out to the field and my something changed in me, something shifted, and there was a, a, a tightening in my body. Um, and, uh, and my mind just started to race as to all the things I should be doing. Um, and I see that a lot in the players that I coach as well. Uh, I've been doing a lot of, of coaching, private coaching, um, and have, uh, have identified that they're going through the same thing. Uh, and I have a friend that's a private trainer out on Long Island um, that, uh, that says he sees a lot of this too, no matter what level, even at the lower levels, but he's working with a lot of uh, NYCFC and, and Red Bull Academy players. Uh, and Cosmo Academy players, and uh, and and sees this type of of relationship with a with a game that that um, disallows or or almost blocks the the play. Um, and that's something that I realized that was coming that when I looked back and started reflecting. I remember little moments where um, where parents and coaches um, were 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 so into our game and were up and all standing up and and coaching us and whatnot and um, and as a little kid, now that I understand the psyche of a, of a kid, I can see how, oh, Seth, we can see, uh, I think you're, uh, oh, actually, we can see your presentation in your text message, oh. just FYI. Um, but we can, we can, oh, uh, sorry, sorry. no worries. So we can, um, we can start to see where these little kids at the developmental state that they're at are, are starting to, or well, are fundamentally trying to get love and safety and they're and they're they're working their entire first 10 12 years of life to do that and i was no different and it and it caused this kind of anxiety starting from when i was seven and eight years old all the way through um my soccer career but i would happen to be one um you can see by my neck um was a bit was a big a big guy that was able to have success at uh these different levels these different youth levels um and so I was able to kind of temporarily get those needs met. But the problem was every time I made the national team or regional team or state team or whatever it was, um, I wasn't satisfied. My body was still was still yearning for, for more, more and more love. Um, and then it got to a point where the, the level of competition became met where my athletic ability was. And that then it got really, really tricky. And I one um, few examples when I first got to Major League Soccer, um, I remember just being scared like the entire four hours that I was at the training facility. Um, and I didn't, I couldn't put words to it then. And I was trying to, you know, kind of whatever, kind of suck up to the older guys or the, or the coaches or, you know, try to busy myself with, with little tasks um, to keep myself from feeling that. Um, and then also at the Olympics, when I went to the Olympics in 2008, um, the kind of uh, the personas and, and all the ego that was in the room was 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 uh, something that would honestly scared me, and I spent the three weeks that I was in the Olympics, which should have been a really awesome experience for me, um, very scared, and uh, and sort of uh, doing anything and everything I could to distract myself from that as well. So that's a little bit of my story and how this all plays in uh, for me. Um, and of course, now I'm I'm pretty passionate about uh, getting getting resources and experience to parents that uh, that that deal with the depth of this thing. So. So your, I'm sure your parents loved you very much. Was it just their 
inexperience or, or lack of knowledge as to how to behave or uh, uh, you know to deal with you in that situation or what, what was that well I so I had a dad that that, that grew up um, he's now 72 73 years old and he grew up with with a, a dad that was a farmer um, slash barber and his dad really really wanted him to be a, um, a pharmacist and pushed him when he was five six years old to be a pharmacist be a pharmacist you've got to be a pharmacist and it's funny um, because my dad completely kind of resisted that and, and ended up becoming a kind of a, a, a band uh, a band guy and was playing his uh, what did he play I don't know he played the uh, uh, the Italian uh, accordion <laughs> the accordion yes so he was, he was big into the accordion kind of left that left the house at 16 17 kind of took off and um, so there was a lot of stuff for him around his dad needing him to be something um, to make to make his dad who I don't know all the stories about about going back that far but his dad was clearly carrying some trauma also was a war veteran um, but needed his son to take care of those emotional needs of his and one of the ways that they would do temporarily is if my dad would do the things that he wanted to do which he did for a little bit I know um, my dad and I have had these conversations but my dad then went into his his parenting with me trying to be a little bit better version and try to create opportunities and not say so much which he didn't he didn't he didn't necessarily push me but his his interaction and his like love for talking about soccer um made me think well i want a relationship with my dad so what am i going to do i'm going to go of course and and play and then when i played well um there was my dad would be super happy because we won he was our coach early on and my mom um uh, i think kind of played the role of of maybe not stepping up and saying something to him at, at certain times, but I think she was again doing her best and was putting food on the table and and was loving me in the way she she could. Um, but there was there was a, a definite need to understand how that was affecting me. And thankfully, now we've kind of come along 30 years and and we're starting to have conversations like this where we where we really understand what's happening with kids and it's not just about providing them all the opportunities in the world. Because we know that that doesn't that doesn't I mean that that brought me my parents gave me every opportunity that they could and I was you know 28 29 at the end of a of an incredible career in Major League Soccer where I was about to blow my brains out and and so we know that that doesn't just giving opportunities doesn't add up to the type of joy and peace and self actualization that we w want for our kids. All right. Okay. So you know, given the the environment that we're in, the the you know the world is in and, and the U.S. Um, you know, what can we do as parents to help our kids as we start to return to activities, get back on the field, you know, uh, in different parts of the country at different stages? Um, but what can we do to ease, you know, the fears and anxieties of the kids? And uh, I guess to an extent, you know, us as parents, you know, to understand, uh, you know, how we should be acting around them and so on and so forth. Well, a lot of that's understanding, uh, of course, it's going, again, they're still looking to us to reflect the story that they're supposed to be experiencing. Like they're looking at what am I supposed to be feeling? That's, that's what, especially the younger they are, the more it's like that. But even for the older kids, the idea is for a lot of them, they're going to go back with a story in their head that they've lost all this time. They've lost all this training. They've lost all this ability. I mean, even parents, my, my, the stress of homeschooling was getting you know too much for my wife and I both working at home trying to homeschool our kids in this tiny apartment. I finally just said that's it, we're done, we're done. They're kindergarten and they're in first grade, they're fine. On to next next year. And and my wife was like, well, what if they get behind? I'm like, what? I mean, one, they're really young, but two, the whole world is going through this together, right? And so what what's most important is that we give a narrative to our kids that going, hey, we're all in this together. If you feel fear about getting behind, guess what the rest of the world's feeling. You know, fear about getting behind. And we're all going to come out there and everyone's going to be not what they maybe thought they were, but the goal is to come out with a new perspective. Let's, let's feel this more. Let's love this more. Let's enjoy this more. Let's take, you know, if parents can come out with a fresh perspective of what's, you know, what's important, man, I should be able to go, let's take the pressure off our kids. Let's allow them to play, you know? And if we give them that narrative, go and play. Go have, I don't even care. Just go and have fun. Go play, right? Then they'll be fine. If any of us feel some sense of we got to get back on this or we got to double down or we got to hustle back up to catch up, 
especially some of us like, well, we're heading into a, you know, a showcase year, a recruiting year of some sort. That's why you have to intentionally, in my opinion, as, as parents, we have to intentionally step back and say, the system will even itself out. Everyone's okay. Everyone's okay. You know, I just was coaching high school ball and I watched all these seniors that were all over. We had a bunch of D1 recruits were ready to win a state championship and they lost their senior season. And the whole time we were going, hey, everybody, we're okay. Everybody's okay and they will find their way and the system will even itself back out. But more than anything, just recognize that if you're telling them a story that they're not where they're supposed to be, they're not in a good enough space, they've got to work harder than they are, then what you're going to do is just you're going to just heap levels of anxiety onto them and that, that is going to make it harder for them to kind of shed the layers of anxiety they've already developed with this system. So understand everyone's okay and everyone's going to be okay. And that's the narrative that has to be put forward no matter what, starting with us and our kids will assimilate that pretty easily. I'll add to that though, you know, I think that's spot on the, the experience of, of I, my, my sister-in-law, I think, tries to kind of give the, the uber positive to her, her kids who are now in high school. Um, and yet when you're around her, you can sense the anxiety and they sense that. And so it makes their experience of that story uh, a little bit shaky because they're like, well, you know, mom, and they, and they have, a hard time. I think they have a hard time asking those questions and articulating themselves, first of all, but also having the courage to say, but look at you, you know? So we have to look at ourselves. No one else is gonna look at ourselves unless your, your, your spouse likes to tell you, you know, what you're doing wrong, which can be helpful <laughs> at times, but, um, but it very much has to be us looking at ourselves so that that story matches our actual experience. And it's okay if you're not feeling at peace during this thing, it's totally okay. But we gotta, we gotta start to invest in ourselves and invest in resources that help us become aware and start to separate ourselves from our experience. Because our experience is one thing, but our actual, who we are is a, is a completely different thing. And as we start to separate those two, like Seth was saying, uh, that, that home and performance world, we're almost doing the same thing as well. Where we have to separate those two things so we can see what our experience is and, and then know deeply who we are and that we're gonna be okay. And then we start to feel that in the body and our kids feel that and when we say that, they're like, oh yeah. And we wouldn't even have to say it probably at that point because they just see us going about our business and right. taking care of in action on whatever needs to be done and they'll follow in too and they'll start to train and, and all the rest. I think we still have, we have a couple of uh, questions popping in here. Yeah, we've got, uh, this one is from uh, Camilla. So uh, Camilla asks, what can we do if a 10 year old player is very nervous uh, once he enters the field uh, in a game, uh, but very, very uh, outside the game, can that be changed? Uh, and how can we help that player? What was it? Can you repeat that? I have the part about outside the game. Ten year old is very nervous once uh, he enters the game, yeah. uh, and outside of the games, uh, I guess before the game is a little bit nervous. And how can we help that player? Yeah. So now ten is interesting, right? Because we're just exiting, just exiting those years, and if they're starting to display that, that is, a, they are already showing PTSD. Okay. Now, not to freak anybody out, I don't want to freak that that parent out, but what they are is they're showing that natural like this this is the formation of on an unconscious level they've already registered at some level that there is something in this there's a danger present here right and essentially it's that remember the 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 younger parts of them what makes me safe what makes me valuable there's a danger here i'm not safe here i will lose value here and that's what nerves are people say well it's normal to be nervous well yeah it's normal to be nervous because human beings are naturally we all we get traumatized but those nerves are them saying there is something not safe here. So the only thing we can do as parents is to completely compensate with a, that doubling down on that safety, right? And we don't do that by being ultra cheer positive. We do that by being a complete and total place of safety for their emotions. So when they're saying, they say, how are you feeling? And if they're able, you know, the idea is to develop a relationship that they can actually speak to you. How are you feeling? Instead of how'd you do? Right. Notice if they're coming out of practice, how was practice? How how'd you do? You know, where we're constantly kind of doing this relationship of reporting what was happening. If we can switch everything and anything possible into an emotional space of how you're feeling, and then anything is okay. Right? Where you just become a place of safety. What if the car was that place of safety? Right. And they get in the car. So they're saying, I'm nervous. You're like, yeah, you want to talk about it? Right. And if they say, Yeah, you know, I just you know, are you afraid you're gonna fail? Is that why you're nervous? 
yeah, you know, and maybe they'll say, I don't know, I don't know. You know okay, well, I'm here, no matter what, no matter what. And then what you try to do is on the sideline, and more and more and more, and you create as neutral response as possible. I'm here, no matter what. I love you, no matter what. It's, it's almost counterintuitive to most parents when they think that it's the cheer that the kids want. But the cheer, actually, it's the cheer that they got at a really young age created that sense of, I get that when I do this, but if I don't do this, then I won't get that. So the idea is to create a deep emotional safety. So when a child is nervous, that's okay, right? You just create as much safety as humanly possible, okay? And then just remember those young parts of them are going through that. Um, reading on frame, if your child is experiencing that, reading on frame will be highly enlightening to you, okay? And because it, some of the activities in there are driven um, by creating relationships. Okay, they're actually done with your child where you're you're having you're asking them certain questions and you're working through certain things with them. So on frame would be a hugely helpful thing. I think your child would find it very, very empowering. But make no mistake, the reason they're nervous, it's got nothing to do with the game. It has everything to do with their sense of identity. Who I am, am I safe? Am I valuable? Okay. And again, all of us carry that type of trauma. But the reason you're seeing it around 10 is that's when they're starting, you know, they come out of those those years, those developmental years, and that's when they start exhibiting those kind of things. So if they're really, really nervous, you know, you can tell them, hey, don't be nervous. People do this all the time. Parents go, don't be nervous. Don't be nervous. Just go have fun. <laughs> you understand? To a child, that's another demand. I have to have fun now. Right? I, just, I just tell my, I get dads all the time. I just tell my kid to have fun. <laughs> like, whoa, wow, that sounds really intense, man. <laughs> like, what if they don't? Right? Because that's the idea. What if they're not having fun? Can we be a safe place of safety and love there? You know? What if they're not enjoying it? What if they're struggling? Can we be a place of safety and love? What if they're nervous? Can we be a place of safety and love? But we have to really shake our egos, put them in check, because all of a sudden the idea of performing well and winning and things like that it has to drop way down on that list of most important things. You know? Okay. Uh, this one's from Amanda. Uh, are there specific guidelines to help this sideline pandemic of parents yelling at kids and having a lot of problems with things? such as uh, playtime coaching, uh, this is for 10 year old. Yeah, yeah, the, well, there's not specific guidelines because again, we've mm -hmm. been given those, right? Everybody's, we all know what we shouldn't do, right? Even mm -hmm. the parents that's doing the yelling and the sending of the email to the thing, at some level knows they shouldn't. I had a dad saying, hey, can you talk to this coach for me? Um, just don't tell him you, I told you because I don't want him to know I did. I'm like, did, did you see that's, that's the problem, right? If you don't want the coach to know that you said something, Probably means you shouldn't have said it, huh? And they're like, oh yeah, that's a good point, you know? But the idea is most of us know at some level we shouldn't do those things. And we've been given guidelines by, our, by our, our clubs for years. Maybe we weren't listening, right? But the answer to this isn't for us to give you guys more guideline, guidelines because one, it hasn't worked. And two, it doesn't really honor the depth of what you're experiencing. There's a reason the parents are going crazy on the sidelines. It's because the strongest thing they have, the deepest thing they experience in their life is their love for their kids. Right. And, and all their trauma is coming up and all their unconscious. Remember, we're a bunch of icebergs on the sidelines floating around, colliding under the water. Right. That's what's creating this thing. So what's required here isn't guidelines. What re required here is an awakening. Right. So if you're the parent that asked that, Amanda, if you're the, one, the parent that asked that, go get yourself on frame or go get yourself some really deep therapy and do the work to get into the space of asking questions why you do that. And if you're seeing other people do it, then call your director of your club and say, we got to get on frame into the, our club across the board for our entire club because we need an awakening as a group of parents. And it's absolutely necessary. Your average sideline is a very toxic place, right? It's a very toxic place and the kids are absorbing that like crazy. I was coaching last year at Bellevue High School and, and the varsity coach is a friend of mine and he's from Tottenham, you know, he's, he's born in Africa and he's he played, you know, in the Arsenal Academy growing up, but he didn't understand this American culture. And he he's there. And at one point he's like, he says, come here. And he says, why do they, why do they keep looking at me? Referring to his players. Why are they looking over here? I go, oh, your, your dad. And he's like, why, why, why my dad? I'm like, you know, so I'll, you know, I'll explain it to you on the way home. Okay. And, and we're, and we're, we're talking about that, but that's the thing is he didn't recognize that they are listening to us. Right. So what needs to happen is not only do we get quiet, but then when they get in the car, we're still quiet and we're a place of emotional safety, right? They get in the car. It's not now that I'm now that coaches are watching. Now I can unleash on the kid or now I can, we can begin the report and what do you need to work on? And you're not getting that playing time. We really need to talk to them. You know, I remember having a, a kid on, you know, the truth is I, I coach for a long time. You play, you play the players that play the best. 
most of the time. And then when you're playing, you know, I'm coaching club, I'm trying to get everybody playing time. But you're also trying to win a game once in a while and that kind of thing. That's just how it is for all coaches. All three of us guys here are coaches. We know that. And I had, I've had moms come to me and go, well, I can see you're not starting her anymore. And I, and I said, yeah, she, well, you know, it's clear. I remember this mom, I said, she goes, well, I just, I can tell you, she's, you just don't like her. And I go, wait, what? I go, did you tell her that? And she says, well, yeah. Wait a minute, you told her I didn't like her? Like, she just won't, she's not working. She's not playing well. She's playing terribly and she won't work, work hard and she's not responding to coaching. It's a really basic thing. But because the mom was so triggered by it, because the mom wasn't getting her needs met anymore, she projected that all over, right? And so the idea is that we wake up, okay? Um, now, basic advice, if you're looking for guidelines, basic advice, if all your input to your kid is, a, is about their emotional, their need for safety and love, it's an emotional place where it's, your question isn't how'd you do, how was practice, your question is how are you feeling, and you're, you're creating an emotional response, it's a very, very different experience for a kid. If they can walk into, they can get in the car and go, how are you feeling? And they can say either good or bad. You know, no matter what they say, it's acceptable. I'm not doing good. You want to talk about it? And they can say yes or no, and that's okay. But we're a place of receiving as a place to input and coach and teach and try to fix. It's going to go way better for you. Way, way better for you. But again, we kind of already knew that at some level. Like we all kind of knew that at some level. The question is, why don't we adhere to it, right? Because we need to wake up. So. Okay, uh, this one's from Allison. Uh, how can you encourage your 11-year-old child who is truly into soccer without any uh, pushiness from uh, parents, uh, but now doesn't want to even kick a ball or run for fun because he isn't on the field with his teammates due to the COVID-19 situation? Well, we don't. We leave him alone. They don't want to kick a ball. We don't make them kick a ball. Now we, you know, I understand that. I, I got kids too. I understand we want them to get some exercise, right? Got to get yourself outside. I just leave a soccer ball laying around. You know, I've got a couple. I can see one on the floor right now. They're just sitting around in the apartment. And so if they want to, that's by way of saying it's available too if you want. But this is actually a really wonderful time for parents to create a deep sense of safety for their kids. We don't have to encourage them because they don't have to get better. What we mm -hmm. want is for kids to play. We want them to play. And if they want to play, if the reason that your kid plays soccer is because they love being with their friends and they're not with their friends right now. And so for them, the context of soccer isn't the same. It's okay. It's totally fine. Just let them go. If they want to go back to soccer, they can. Now, if that's difficult for you to let go of, then check that. You know, then it's that's a really great opportunity for you to go, why do I need them to do this? Why do I want them to? Well, what if they don't get back to that same team? Yeah, that's okay. It's okay. And so when your child's 11 years old, what a wonderful time for them to be able to go back and go, ah, I'm not as good as I used to be. And you can go, oh, okay, well, what do you want to do? I need to improve. Okay. You want to improve? And you let them work towards it, right? They're 11 years old. They're not six. 11, 12, 13. They're still kids, but they're in that space now where they can start to explore that their actions have consequences and that kind of thing, right? So you can let them develop that sense of what they want. And if they don't want to play, that's okay, right? Soccer is a great game. It's a wonderful game. Let it stay a game if they want to play it. If it's fun, they'll play. And if for them, fun is being with my friends when I play soccer. I totally get that. I don't want to. I like juggling a ball, but not only for so long. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm not mm -hmm. sitting here. I love soccer more than anything, but I haven't been playing soccer here in my apartment, you know, because I like playing with my men's team. It makes a lot of sense. For most kids, the stuff they do is contextual, and that's okay. That's totally okay. If you have a need for them to become some kind of player, that's on you, not them. So you got to step back and just go, it's totally okay. And let them over time, let them consistently see that response. It's okay. If you don't want to play, it's fine. And after a while, they'll start to feel, it'll take a little time, but they'll start to feel really safe. And it's not going to necessarily make them want to play, but it will take any fear. It'll take fear out of the game for sure. Because they'll start to take more ownership. Oh, it's, I play if I want to play. Right. You know? and, Actually, yeah. Can I add one thing? Yeah, let me, let me finish this real quick. Because when we were out in Long Island, the first time we came out to Long Island, we went to a pub with a bunch of the bunch of guys. I think it was from Garden City, a bunch of guys from Garden City, a bunch of dads. And we had a dad ask this question. It was really important. He's like, how do I get my son to love soccer as much as he loves Fortnite? And I said, I think, Ronan, you were there at the table. You and I were sitting next to each other. I said, I said well, I don't necessarily know how to do that. I said, but I know how to make him hate Fortnite. You know, just stand behind him and just tell him every time he dies, just give him a little bit of critique, tell him what he should do better. And give them, do that for a couple of weeks, they'll hate Fortnite, guarantee you. And they all kind of laugh, but that's true. 
right? Why do they love Fortnite so much? Because they play and nobody's telling them what to do, what they're learning as they go. And they just, it's a free flowing, moving kind of space where no one's standing over their shoulder saying, hey, you should do this, you know, or you shouldn't do that. That's why they love it. Pat, what are you gonna say? I was just gonna add that, that that part of us that is that response in us that we need our kids to get back on the field. We need them to, because we're afraid that maybe they'll they'll go on to a lower level team or what, whatever the reason is, is actually a defense mechanism built inside of us to keep us from feeling. So if we can take a step, just one step toward actually feeling what our, our the experience is in our body, um, we'll go beyond that story in our head, um, the, the egoic defense mechanism that's saying that they need to do something um, because something's gonna happen in the future that we don't even know if it's gonna happen. And honestly, you might you might back off of them for a couple of weeks and it might be a thing where then they pick up the ball and then they start getting better and then the coach is like, man, this kid is so much freer when he came, you know, when he comes back and he might even elevate it a, a level, you know, you just, we just don't know what's going to happen in the future. Um, and obviously this thing's has taught us all that, um, in different ways. Yeah. So we've got a, a question here from Angelo. And I think it's along the same, uh, same theme. Uh, what would your approach on getting a child motivated as, uh, some of the interest or focus to the game has been interrupted for such a, an extended period of time, obviously due to COVID-19. Mm same kind of theme yeah yeah i wouldn't actually try to motivate your child i wouldn't i i, I don't think i think motivation is an internal thing can, you can give opportunities for a kid to be to be motivated um you know my daughter uh, is doing cartwheels she does that's all she does she's just in the apartment all day long just cartwheels 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 i can say she's motivated to do cartwheels right and i can ask a question like why she's so motivated to do cartwheels i don't know she's doing them she's really working on her cartwheels right but the but idea, if a child's not doing something, it's because they don't want to do the thing. Now, if you said, if I said to my son right now, if I said, hey, kids, let's get in the car, I'm going to the park, and I took a soccer ball with me and I popped it out there, they'd probably start running and kicking the ball. So if you want to play with your kid, again, for your kids, especially the ages we're talking about, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, time with you is the most important thing to them in the world. Okay? Take them to a park with a ball, say, hey, will you come kick a ball around with me? See what they do then. Maybe they, they get motivated. But trying to get them to work on something, I know all the clubs out there are giving digital workout sessions. I don't know one single kid, well, maybe one or two, that really would wants to do that, right? It's not, because it's not within the context of relationship. It's not fun. It's not competitive. None of, it's none of the things they love about playing, right? You know, it's, what they want to do is be in relationship. They want to play. They want to. I mean, I was coaching my, the last club team I ever coached was a bunch of, it was U9, really young boys. And I was treating them like high school kids for a while until my wife noticed that. She goes, hey, she goes, they're, they're little boys. They want to play. They don't want to work. I'm like, you know what? You're right. All the, I mean, I have to stop them rest from wrestling with each other the whole time, right? You know, and, and not get them to pit grass. But if I, if I just throw a ball out there and just said play, they would just naturally do it, right? They want to play. They don't want to work. And digital training sessions for a 10 year old feels a lot like work. It's like homework, right? So if you want to motivate them, make his, turn it into play by engaging in relationship with them, take them out to a field, throw a ball out there, um, see what happens. But you know, as far as these workout sessions go and all that kind of stuff, kids aren't getting better doing that stuff. Mm -hmm. This idea that we've got to do, we've got to get touches or we're gonna get, no, nah, well, you put them back on the field, I guarantee you, and most of them aren't gonna lose this time. You know? They're not at all, especially if you go out and they just play against you. you know? Good advice. Um, so, as as parents, are there signs that uh, you know in our kids that we should look for that uh, you know demonstrate some of the PTSD that you mentioned before? And uh, you know, how do we broach the issue with our kids? You know, what do we do if we see some of the telltale signs? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, signs are things, really basic things. Like earlier, there's the question about nervous. If your kid gets real nervous, okay, that's a sign. PTSD. And you can say that's natural. Yeah. Well, yeah. Nobody gets out of childhood without some, some trauma. Okay. Shows up, especially 10, 11, 12, 13. Right? And those years is where the, that starts showing up. Uh, nervous, um, really insecure. If you see them, even when you watch them play, if they play uh, for safety, right? It's always safety. It's not, there's very little risk taking. There's very little working on weaknesses. They just kind of do the same thing they've always done. If you see them and you hear them analyzing whether they're going to win or lose ahead of time, so if like you're going to your head into the game and they're like, yeah, I think we might win today. And you can see that there's this like, we're trying to figure out, are we going to win? That's because unconsciously they're saying, are we safe today? Are we going to get loved today? Or are we not? 
You know, most of the players, most players that I know, they're already analyzing, even at a pro level, are we going to win today? Are we not going to win today? Right? They're not going out there to prepare for the fun of the battle. They're going out there, they're like, are we okay? And they're trying to solve that problem before they even start the game. Um, but it, for these kids, it shows up as nerves, anxiety, and then shut down, where their bodies kind of shut down and they approach it from this, like, just survive kind of space. Um, and if, if that's the case, again, it's not something we can approach with them. They're children. You can put them into play therapy or do therapeutic work with them, but you're the, the parents are the ones that can fix that by waking themselves up and reversing the condition that brought that on. So again, if we, we become awakened parents that live completely to create a sense of deep safety for our kids, emotional safety, the car becomes the safest place in the world after practice, then that, that will reverse itself over time it will actually create the healing that's needed, right? And sometimes, you know, some people are like, well, have we done too much damage that we can't reverse it? No, it can be reversed over time. But again, we're not, you know, we're, we're building people here. You know, their soccer careers, no matter how far they get, are going to be over when they're very young people. So what we're trying to do is create something that if you can wake yourself up by doing therapeutic work, going through on frame, things like that. If you go through on frame, I would just say, go get on frame, go through it, and it will create the awareness within you that to actually reverse that situation and you will create more of that emotional safety. Okay. So that's the whole idea. Your kid, if your kid is showing signs like this and you start to see like, yeah, it looks like, you know, you'll see him less smiling, less laughing. Okay. That means less play, the more work, mm -hmm. right? If soccer is not a place where they're, where they're, if you don't see them goofing off anymore, they're not being kids anymore. Um, that means they're working. Right. Um, you look for those kind of those signs that this is very, very serious. 10, 11, 12 year old kids should not be very serious. Even your kid, if you have a kid who's kind of serious, it's not, it's not natural for children to do that, right? You want them to be goofballs to get in trouble once in a while, right? So look for smiles. I mean, I never, I don't think I ever saw, I saw Pat smile one time, I think, in, when he played pro soccer and that's when he scored the MLS goal of the year in 2012. And he kind of smiled, but he wasn't really sure what was going on, right? I'm one of my favorite players ever was a guy named Eddie Henderson and he played way back in the day in, in, in the old a league and he laughed his butt off the whole game. Like guys would sweep his legs out from underneath him after he beat two guys and somebody tried try to cleat him and he'd jump up laughing, you know, he just smiled and laughed the whole game. Well, what's funny about him. I asked him, I met him and I got to hang out with him and, and I was asking about that. Well, he was one of 18 children. His parents never saw him play. His dad didn't see him play until one game as a professional because they both had three jobs to support their 18 kids. And he said, he goes, yeah, he goes, I can see now. We talked about this. And he said, my relationship with soccer developed very separately from my relationship with my mom and dad. He goes, it was just mine. And so he just kept playing. He was in his 30s and he was still playing. I asked him, I said, when did it become work? And he said, when I was 35 after my fifth knee surgery, it started to feel like work. I'm like, yeah, that makes sense. Right? Yeah. So the goal is that they would play, let them play as much as humanly possible. Okay, uh, we've got one, uh, this is for you, Seth, uh, from Jacqueline. Um, how do you talk to your children about COVID? Uh, it's a scary topic, even for adults, and I'd like some verbiage to use uh, that they feel empowered with info, but also something that's age appropriate. Yeah, Jackie, uh, Jackie, can you type in the box there how old? I can't remember how old your kids are. Um, I, I know, I know Jackie, but I, don't know how, I can't remember how kids are, how older kids are, unless, Pat, unless you remember, but I think they're, I think one's still, oh yeah, the oldest one is I think five or six, the youngest one's like three. Yeah, oh, yeah, well, it's funny because our kids talk about it and I'll, I'll ask them literally, what do you guys think about coronavirus? And they'll go, typically, I hate coronavirus. They'll say that, I go, me too. No, me too. What do you guys hate about coronavirus? And we do this on a regular basis. What do you guys hate about it? And they'll be like, my, and typically my son's six and he'll say, I miss my friends, I miss my friends, I miss my friends. I say they all miss their friends. And we just give them a place to talk about it. And, and then I'll say things like, do you guys know what coronavirus is? And like, yeah, but it's, it's like, a, it's a sickness. Yeah, but it's a sneaky sickness is what we've been saying. It's a super sneaky sickness, kind of like ninjas. You know, we use the word ninja. They know that ninjas are sneaky. It's a thing in cartoons and stuff. So we, we use, we call it a sneaky sickness. It's kind of sickness that sneaks around and tries to get people. So that's one of the reasons why we have, we're staying here and we're staying safe. You know, and it's not going to get us as long as we're smart. And then when the doctors say, hey, it's safe now, you guys can all come out, then we'll come out. And until then, we just get to be together. And it's going to be a tricky one, you know. And so we just talk about it. We talk about it as a sneaky sickness. 
It's kind of like ninjas. <laughs> and, but the idea is, again, I understand the entire time that they're what they're looking for. You know, somebody said, well, if you tell them it's a sneaky, sneaky sickness that can affect other people, won't they get scared? They will get scared if they read anxiety on your face. If they feel anxiety coming from you, where it's that they and they hear it and they see you watching the news all the time. And it's this thing where you're living in anxiety. They will live in anxiety and they will go, this is I am not safe and I am not OK because mom's freaked out. Right. But if they're going, we're fine. Everybody's OK. You know, we're going to be just fine. And mom and dad are going to protect you guys no matter what. And we're going to protect each other no matter what. And then you just let it go. They go, ah, OK. And they will remember this time as just a time that was kind of pain in the ass because they didn't get to see their, their kid. They didn't get to see their friends anymore. And they don't want ever coronavirus to ever come back again. And that's the, how they'll feel about it. It'll be a very simple thing. Um, but if again, if they read anxiety on you, they'll feel it. And they yeah. absorb that stuff from us. Yeah. Okay. Uh, guys, I think we're coming close to the end of, uh, of our time. Is there, uh, you know, I want to uh, thank you both for, for being with us tonight. I want to thank everybody. Uh, who took part uh, in tonight's uh, webinar. Is there uh, information where if somebody has a question or a follow-up uh, that they could reach out to you guys and contact you guys? Absolutely. IaniTraining.com is our website, and, and you can scroll down to the bottom. There's a form for out there if you have questions for us. Um, you know, if, you're, if you want your club to get involved with getting on frame into your club, uh, there's a way to do that there. But all our information there, there's some great videos, including a a video by you're the one and only Jackie Cavallini talking about her experience on, on frame um, on there as well. If anybody is looking for actual therapeutic work, either for themselves or for their child, uh, dealing with anxiety and that kind of thing, my website is sethallentaylor.com. And uh, you can go there and click on life coaching. And I do 12 sessions with people, uh, parents and players, uh, to, to help work through some of this stuff on a deeper level. Um, but yeah, yeah, and then of course you can find us on Amazon as well. But yanitraining.com is the best place to go at this point. Good stuff, guys. Thank you very much. Always a pleasure to chat with you guys. Uh, take care of yourselves. Be well, and uh, hope everyone in, on the West Coast is doing well. And uh, we'll be seeing you. Uh, see, hopefully, seeing you very soon in, in person as opposed to virtually. And uh, thanks everybody tonight for uh, for being with us. And uh, take care of yourselves and be safe. Thanks a lot, brother. Thank My you. Guess.